Welcome to NCSA 2020 Virtual. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the 2019 recipient of the John F. Snobble Distinguished Contributions to Teaching Award, Dr. Stephanie Medley Rath. Dr. Rath, Medley Rath earned her PhD in sociology from Georgia State University and serves as an assistant professor of sociology at Indiana University, Kokomo. Her contributions to the scholarship of teaching and learning are impressive. She published 11, 12, 11 trails articles um, and countless refereed publications and presentations. In our address today, Dr. Medley Rath will discuss the importance of developing undergraduate students' sociological research skills throughout the curriculum. She will describe the challenges she faced and the scholarship she has undertaken to illuminate the scope of the problem. She will present findings from her first project in this line of research about changes in the undergraduate sociology students' knowledge, confidence, and experience doing research over time. In addition, she'll share with us preliminary findings from, a study, from studying undergraduate sociology textbooks to determine how well textbooks integrate methods throughout the curriculum. And now I will turn things over to Dr. Stephanie Medley Rath. Thank you for that great introduction. Okay. All right. Um, so thank you for watching my John F. Schnabel address for the North Central Sociological Association entitled Missed Opportunities, Developing Undergraduate Student Sociological Research Skills Throughout the Curriculum. First, I wanted to share some acknowledgments and thank uh, some of the folks who've helped with my research presented in this talk. Uh, my undergraduate research assistant, Rebecca Morgan, has provided substantial assistance on both research projects that I'm going to talk about in this presentation. Uh, Greg Kordsmeyer, Jamie Oslowski Lopez, and Nikki Brown provided feedback on the survey instrument used in the first study. Thanks to all the faculty that let us survey their students and the students for participating. Um, this research was um, partially funded by an Indiana University Teaching and Learning Prototype Grant. Um, so since we're virtual, I wanted to make sure that everyone knew how they could get in contact with me if they uh, choose to, if they have questions about this presentation um, or comments, um, you can find me on Twitter at Learn Sociology or by email at smedleyr at iuk.edu. So today, even though we're apart, um, I invite you to participate in this presentation using your mobile device or laptop. And Okay, so sorry, the instruction slide didn't show up like it was supposed to, but um, we can use this um, practice slide that I, um, I had arranged as well. So I'm using Poll Everywhere in this talk, so that way um, I can get a little bit of engagement, even if it's later on and um, not quite live. Um, so you can join a couple of different ways. Um, you can go to the website listed at the top of the screen, pollev.com slash stephaniemed208, or with your cell phone, you can text Stephanie Med 208 to 22333 to join. So the first practice um, question is just, what is your name? So this way I have some idea who maybe is in my audience. Um, so, uh, next, I'm gonna ask you, before we get too far into the weeds here, what is a sociologist? And then what does a sociologist do? So you can again text that answer to Stephanie Med 208 to 22333. So what is a sociologist and what does a sociologist do? Right. Uh, so sociology, it's both a way of thinking and a way of doing. I think most of us probably understand um, that sociology is a way of thinking. It's probably one of our main goals when we're teaching intro to sociology and many of our other courses. You know, we hope our graduates are able to um, think sociologically, develop a sociological perspective, um, develop a sociological imagination. Um, but how do we know a student 
has these things. Um, that's certainly one of our challenges, um, and it's a challenge we have spent a lot of time on. Um, I'm a little bit more interested, especially in this talk right now, is thinking about um, what is it that a sociologist does. Um, so, you know, I believe that sociology is also a way of doing. So not just a way of thinking, but a way of doing. Um, so with that being said, uh, we need to really think about what are the skills of the sociologist? Um, what's the, and when we're thinking about those skills, we also want to consider what's the role of the research methods course in the sociological curriculum because in general for many of us um, we're going to see method methodological skills as being uh, you know, part of the the main tools not the only tools but some of the main tools of the sociologist um, so we need to explore more what the role of research methods courses uh, are in the sociology curriculum and also ask our question, ourselves questions about what is it that our students do after graduation, um, which can help us uh, consider and help us think about and decide, well, which research tools are we going to help our students develop? Because there are many research um, tools out there. Um, there's many sociological tools that we could develop uh, or help our students develop. So where do our students go after graduation? Of course, some go to graduate school um, where that's pretty obvious. They're going to be using sociological skills. They need to develop them. Um, but many and probably most of our graduates are often going into human service occupations where um, the, the path for uh, you know, research skills translation in those, those fields may be a little bit harder for us to envision and also a little bit more difficult for us to communicate with our students. Um, and then we also have some students who do go into more data science type occupations where again the connection is, is much more concrete. Um, however, students need to develop skills relating both to consuming and producing research. So even though our students who are, are maybe going into human service occupations where um, the research skills development may not seem as important, they need to be able to consume research. They need to uh, be sure that the work they're doing is informed by best practices in the literature. Um, they need to be able to uh, collect evaluation uh, research data for their own programs in order to help secure grant funding um, and and, uh, you know funding from donors more generally um, so developing the the research skills um, for both consuming and producing research is important for all of our students not just the students who we may perceive as uh, top of the class and going to graduate school um, but it's important for all of our students to have um, this uh, um, understanding and develop these skills um, so I was presented with an opportunity to some extent um, that really put me on this path um, to thinking about the role of research methods throughout the sociology curriculum. So in 2018, I inherited the senior seminar um, course and I was told that students complete a research project in the course. This coincided with my university institutionalizing student travel, professional presentations among undergraduates and other high impact or high impact like practices through actually providing financial support. You've likely seen me at NCSA the last couple of years with a whole bunch of undergrads with me. You know, very fortunately, our institution was able to support their travels so that their um, attendance cost them very little money. Like they had to pay for a couple of meals, but the rest of it was paid for by the university. So we were very fortunate that way. Um, we've also developed at IU Kokomo something called the Kokomo Experience in You, um, which further is institutionalizing this push for having these high impact experiences. And then the sociology department, we decided that for the fourth year experience, um, that would be attending a professional conference and presenting uh, their research. Um, so I was able to bring my entire senior seminar class to NCSA. This is my group that did not get to come because of the pandemic um, and they were all ready to go. They had practiced their presentations and everything. So I wanted to give them a, you know, some something so they can say they were here. Um, so, but the, you know, having this also presented a number of challenges. Uh, we have to have IRB approval um, because the student research projects 
almost always involve human research subjects and they're presented outside of Indiana University, we have to go through the IRB approval process. Of course, ethically, it's the right thing to do, um, but it also prevent, uh, presents some challenges um, getting students through that process. It's the first time they've ever done anything like an IRB um, approval. Um, you know, it, I have support from the IRB at, at IU, um, so they're very helpful um, and get a, get the projects through very quickly, um, but it is an additional um, hurdle. Um, time is another issue because the senior seminar course is taught as a one semester class. It happens during the spring semester, uh, which is the same semester as NCSA. So every spring I build out my syllabus based on when is NCSA, because that determines when everything else has to be done in advance of uh, the conference. Um, we also, or I meet with the students during the fall semester, late in the fall, so I can figure out what their projects are going to be so they can get abstracts ready as well. So, um, you know, it's kind of a big ask to get a class full of undergrads to get me abstracts before Christmas, before they're even officially enrolled in the course, because the, the abstract submission due date is typically either the week before our semester begins or the week of. Um, so, you know, time is definitely a challenge. Um, but, you know, these to some extent are somewhat manageable. Um, probably the, the, you know, the biggest challenge is really student readiness. Um, in sociology, and most of you likely already know this, students are often late to the major, right? They, they often, sociology wasn't their first choice. Um, we might be their second, third, fourth, or even fifth choice sometimes. Uh, but that means that they're often late to our major and trying to get through prerequisites along with their um, course other course requirements all in a timely fashion so they can still graduate uh, fairly quickly. Um, so that can be a challenge, uh, making sure that students have the prerequisites um, and uh, if they're waived into the class, making sure that they're waived in a appropriately. Um, we also have students who are concurrently enrolled in some prerequisites. So we, you know, we try to um, shuffle when our prereqs are offered so we can try to uh, prevent some of that from happening. But um, it's inevitable that some end up uh, being enrolled in both theory and senior seminar at the same time, or more typically they're in statistics at the same time as senior seminar. Um, however, um, what I have noticed, though, is that even when students come into the class meeting all the prerequisites, they still struggle doing their own research project, which, you know, of course, is to be expected. You know, I've been doing this for a very long time at this point, and I still struggle putting together full research projects. So, you know, to, to think that it wouldn't be a struggle for someone whose only exposure to research methods is a couple of classes, um, you know, th that shouldn't really be all that surprising. And the outcomes, of course, were not all that surprising. Um, so when I reviewed the um, student evaluations that first year and also that second year, um, you know, students said, at times I felt the instructor was extremely stressed because of everything that was going on with the NCSA project. They were right uh, that, you know, I was definitely stressed. Uh, and, you know, they recognized this. Uh, and, you know, I was honest with them too. I said, look, I've never taught this class before. Um, I've never helped get students through the IRB process. Like all of this is new. Um, it, so, you know, I tried to be flexible where I could, but also reiterating that you are presenting a, a project at a professional conference. So I can be flexible, but there are limits to my flexibility as well. Um, but then students also viewed it as a positive experience. So while they may have been stressed in the moment, um, at the end of the semester, they were also grateful for the experience. Um, another student said, taking students to NCSA was a wonderful idea. This gives students the opportunity to present at a conference that not everyone gets, and they're right. You know, most undergrads don't get this kind of experience at all. Um, so they do see the value in it, even if it is stressful and difficult along the way, and they hate me and sociology and everything about <laughs> everything um, while they get through um, the project. Um, so because I had, uh, you know, challenges um, and, you know, the students were stressed and I was stressed, even if at the end everyone thought it was great, there's still a lot of stress involved. Um, so, of course, I turned to the literature to try to figure out, you know, what could I do to make it easier for them and also easier for me um, to, you know, pull this all off. So when I go to the literature about um, having students do research projects in sociology, there's 
plenty of scholarship on the limitations of time, which that surprises no one. We all know research takes time um, and you know, how long it takes me to do a project is way longer than a single semester. I mean, I'd have a thousand publications if it only took me a semester to do a research project. Um, so we know it takes time. Um, and, but we have the parameters of the semester and we have the parameters of is a senior experience a one semester or a two semester sequence. Um, you know, we have the, those limitations. Um, so the scholarship on the limitations of time though offer um, these uh, pearls of wisdom uh, have it well first they take the they seem to assume that the complete research project is ideal um, and what ways to um, do the, co the complete research project or do research in general uh, within these limitations of time include having um, projects done in groups uh, which I do now the first semester I let them do individual projects and now I almost require it so there may be an exception here or there but for the most part they are in groups unless they have a compelling reason to not be and a compelling reason might be they started working on the project independently to some extent or with a faculty member prior to the semester that would be an exception but um, that's fairly unusual um, so completing projects in groups, uh, do projects that do not involve participant recruitment. So things like observation in public places, work on instructor design studies. So where the instructor has already secured IRB approval um, and having students jump on board a little bit further in the process. Um, completing parts of a complete project. So maybe they interview people, but then they don't analyze the data or maybe you have data collected and they just analyze the data. So something along those lines. Um, designing projects that involve collaborating within one's uh, department. Uh, and engaging students in institutional research. So, you know, getting involved with the offices of institutional research may be something that um, is helpful. Um, but overall, based on the available scholarship, it seems that time is the biggest challenge and is also solvable using the right strategies. Overall, the scholarship of teaching and learning and research methods um, here, most of this research has occurred in standalone research methods courses as opposed to looking at things more throughout the curriculum or happening in elective courses. So most of the research um, that does exist on studying research methods and how it's taught takes place in statistics methods classes, qualitative methods and research methods courses. Uh, there's uh, a lot of focus on a single activity or approach to a single course um, and mostly presents the complete research project as ideal. So everything from the conceptualization of the research idea all the way to the presentation of results, which is, you know, whether that should be ideal or not, I'm not so sure. That's a pretty big ask of, uh, of what most students um, are really able to do in a single semester and not that they're not able to, it's just they have other classes, they're working, you know, this is one small component of a bachelor's degree. You know, they can get a bachelor's degree without doing this. Um, so, you know, it's not like it's preventing them from getting a master's uh, degree by uh, not doing a, a complete thesis or something along those lines. Uh, you know, they might not get the degree in sociology, but they can still get a bachelor's degree even if they don't uh, do a complete research project. Uh, and, you know, and I, I'm also somewhat skeptical of this being a complete ideal because of just you know, we all know how long it takes to do research. We might muddle through conceptualizing a research project for weeks, months, even years before we do anything that resembles data collection, uh, let alone presenting the results. Um, I also looked at um, the SOTL research on research methods beyond sociology, and overall, there appears to be a lack of a pedagogy culture for teaching research methods and there's a lack of resources for teaching research methods so this isn't just something that's special for sociology this is a, an issue or a problem beyond um, our discipline um, from those uh, studies uh, those researchers uh, have 
uh, done a couple of pretty thorough literature review or synthesizing the literature um, and early found after reviewing 89 articles about teaching research methods that several gaps exist that more research is needed about student learning assessment learning objectives whether the research methods courses incorporate the consumer or producer side of research uh, Wagner Garner and Kowalich uh, in their literature review of 195 articles, um, they found that gaps remain uh, regarding the role and desirable characteristics of a research methods teacher, um, the challenges of teaching and learning specific aspects of research methods, and commonalities and differences in research methods between disciplines. Overall, uh, research exists on teaching research methods, but it tends to rely on weaker data. Uh, weaker data is quite common, so including uh, you know, studies that have student perceptions of learning, uh, student retrospective accounts, uh, course evaluations, pre and post tests of students' research experience, reflective case studies, learning diaries and student assignments. Um, studies using stronger data but are rarer include those using pre and post test measures of student learning, quasi experimental design, mixed methods research, assessment of the methods curriculum, and longitudinal beyond a single semester. Um, so, and you'll note on a couple of these slides, I say that references are available upon request. So if anyone wants to see who all is doing what, um, I can certainly share that. Um, overall, I feel like I'm saying overall a lot right now, um, but the consensus seems to be, for the most part, we're a success. Much of the scholarship indicates success. Um, it's here I did this thing and look at all at how much students learned um, based on a single semester, a single intervention in a single course. Okay, um, and I completely understand why that's what a lot of the research um, looks like because of some of the challenges I've encountered um, by trying to do this, do a longitudinal study, which I'll uh, come to uh, shortly. Um, but Balu, Polly, and Worrell find that the two year period of methodological training for students was not a sufficient length of time for the majority of participants to retain knowledge that was significantly different from their starting point. And moreover, their findings persisted even among students who completed an empirical research project. Uh, so, you know, for, from here, from uh, their study, even if we had students do things over a longer period of time and they're getting that empirical research project experience, uh, it doesn't mean that they're going to necessarily retain any more knowledge than what they started with, which is troubling, uh, to be honest. Um, when we look at all the, the research as a whole, though, we ha do have to keep in mind that success is published, failure is not. Um, so, of course, we have this overwhelming um, you know, consensus that if we just do this one little thing differently, um, that you know, we're going to have success overall, whereas Baloo and, and colleagues suggest that might not be quite what's going on. We have to be honest, teaching and learning research methods is hard. Um, so, you know, it's hard for the teacher, but it's also hard for our students. We're asking them to do things they've never done before. Um, the content can be pretty abstract. Uh, it's, we're asking them to do things at the top of Bloom's taxonomy. Um, the teaching, uh, the, the trend is more superficial teaching in research methods, um, according to students who've been, you know, surveyed based on um, research methods instruction. Um, other indicators of difficulty include a weak linkage between theory and practice, lack of familiarity with quantitative and statistical concepts, challenges creating and integrating pictures of research for understanding, and just negative attitudes overall. Uh, you know, sociology or sociological research methods teaching does not have to be abstract or taught superficially. So, you know, there's certainly a challenge here um, for anyone who's teaching uh, research methods types courses um, to really, you know, think and reflect. Am I offering uh, superficial teaching here? Um, is it too abstract? What might I be able to do differently? Most troubling, however, is uh, Gail Markle's a study finding that students perceive research methods as part of a separate, perhaps hostile culture to which most social science students do not belong, 
but that they must pass through in order to complete their degree. So that's likely, I, from my perspective, one of the more troubling um, aspects of all this, or one of the more troubling findings from the scholarship, um, is that students feel like they do not belong in research methods courses, that it's something they have to go through. I mean, which is true. Most of us likely have required courses in order to get the degree, but they are such different courses from what most other courses are in uh, a university or college's program. You know, they often look and operate a lot differently than our elective courses. Um, so it makes sense that they would view our elective courses as fun and um, entertaining to some extent and the research methods courses as being quite difficult. Students need tiny wins. Um, so I argue that if we continue to teach research methods during a single chapter in introductory sociology, two standalone courses, so a methods and statistics and a complete project as part of a senior seminar type course, then of course students will have difficulty doing the complete research project. Moreover, they haven't had enough tiny wins to suggest that they have the knowledge, confidence, and skills to conduct their own research study. You know, from that first senior your seminar course and, and since then I do feel that uh, or do perceive a lot of my students really they they lack the confidence to do the research there because they're being asked to do something they have never done before um, so if they get more experience earlier on they're they likely will have more of the confidence to be able to pull this off um, let's see, so where's the scholarship on teaching research methods across the sociological curriculum? Um, some of the limitations I've already mentioned that there's a focus on research methods courses as opposed to elective sociology courses. There's very few studies that um, are based in the intro to sociology courses to, for how methods are taught. However, uh, when I went to the literature, um, I found that there have been several calls for incorporating research skills throughout the curriculum. So I am by no means the first to do this, um, but it was interesting to see that, wow, people have been making this call for 30 plus years. Um, so where are we? So it's not a new uh, issue or challenge by any means. Um, so I have another question for you. Um, so where are research skills taught in the sociology curriculum at your institution? So again, send this as a text if you can, Stephanie Med 208 to 22333. If you need more time than uh, the amount I pause on this, you can also pause this recording and uh, you know, send in your response um, and then resume watching. So when we look a little bit at research skills in the sociology um, curriculum, uh, we can uh, reflect on where it's likely taught at our own institutions. We likely have major requirements. Uh, one or two methods courses, typically a research methods course that's sort of a hodgepodge of everything possibly related to research methods, and likely um, a statistics course, so those aren't required everywhere. Um, so we can look specifically at the curriculum at, across the nation um, and sociology programs to see exactly what is being uh, uh, required in um, coursework. Um, but another place we can also look is in um, our textbooks. Um, so when we look at our intro to sociology texts, um, that's, you know, they often have a standalone methods chapter, not always, but it seems that that is maybe more standard. Um, social problems uh, text and elective text tend to combine methods in the introduction itself, so uh, t are more likely to lack um, a methods uh, chapter at all. And that is if methods are addressed in any substantial way at all. So I don't even know that the social problems and elective courses need a separate methods um, chapter. Um, and to some extent, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that the intro texts do because what happens is that even when they have a chapter, um, the things that are taught in that chapter are not necessarily threaded throughout the rest of the book. They're here they are in this one chapter and then we move on to the next topic. Um, so, you know, the reinforcing uh, those concepts is definitely lacking in a lot of our um, books. 
Um, so overall, the problem is there's a lack of integration of methodological skills development throughout the sociology curriculum, and there's also a lack of scholarship on the integration of research methods instruction across the sociological um, curriculum. Uh, so my first study. Um, so in this study, um, in, so in an effort to help students get these tiny wins through their degree, I added more intensive research components to my upper level elective courses. Uh, the original goal um, of my research was to see if having students participate in an intensive research project in an upper level non-research methods elective course would improve students' confidence and knowledge during research and if the effect would persist over time. So I had big, this big vision of I'm going to give them this more in-depth research experience in an upper level elective course um, and track and see how well they do compared to other students um, over time. Unfortunately, the course in question had low enrollment. I only had 13 students in that course and I only received data across two semesters from four students in that class. Um, so that presents pretty significant problems with me being able to see if that one intervention actually had any sort of impact on these students. Um, and of course, this also ex speaks to the difficulty doing longitudinal research, especially with small samples. Um, and, and even in this case, I thought, I know many of these students and I, you know, and I would give examples in class about how hard it is to get uh, people to participate in your research and students still wouldn't participate in my research, even when I said how difficult it was or even when they had personal experience um, as part of um, the study that they were doing in, in the class itself, um, they still weren't super motivated to uh, take the time to fill out my survey. Um, so instead, um, because I had um, difficulties with the project as originally conceived, I pivoted a little bit so that I can look at overall trends and the relationship between confidence, knowledge, and experience. Because in the survey, students are asked a series of questions um, where they uh, rate their confidence doing particular research tasks. And those might be um, conducting a literature review or using SPSS or writing survey questions, those kinds of things. Um, they also indicate how much experience they have doing a series of research tasks. Um, so, you know, they self-report, you know, are they a beginner? Do they feel like they're competent? Um, those kinds of things. And then I also have a series of questions that are knowledge-based. So I went back um, to that first senior seminar class says papers and I had already identified the areas in which they really struggled and those were the areas where I created um, just multiple choice questions on the survey instrument um, where there's a right or wrong answer so I could see um, how students improve so things like being able to identify whether or not um, a sample is a convenient sample or a random sample um, whether or not they could um, identify you know the the best way to actually conduct a literature review. Um, you know, is it to start with Google or to start with a library database? So I asked some knowledge based questions um, like that as well. Um, and I have those results for, I had pre and post test surveys. Um, so either myself or my research assistant uh, went into every upper level elective course offered at my institution in sociology um, and ask students to um, participate by completing the survey at the beginning of the semester and then again at the end of the semester. Participation was voluntary. Um, overall, we did have 58 students complete both a pre and post survey during a single semester. So we have, uh, I can't remember the number that completed it across two semesters. I think maybe 28 students um, completed it over um, two semesters, but right now um, I'm mainly focusing on analyzing uh, the results from a single semester. So I can, I can do that and then later I'll be able to do a little bit with, um, you know, what happens over the course of two semesters with these students. Um, Let's see. So I am sharing some preliminary results on the next two slides. Uh, research analysis is very much still in progress. So um, just keep that in mind when you, you read the data. 
Um, so in the, this first table, um, these are my paired t-tests for um, confidence. Um, overall, uh, confidence declined um, for students on a variety of measures. Um, so on uh, maybe not quite every single measure of confidence, um, but from the beginning of the semester to the end of the semester, their confidence declined, which is super disappointing because we would hope that their confidence would improve. Um, the, uh, the next disappointing finding is that knowledge also <laughs> declined from the beginning to the end of the semester. Um, not quite as, um, as extensively as the the other uh, measure um, but um, knowledge also seemed to decline so it's really hard to figure out what's really going on here um, so I you know I'm still in the midst of analyzing this data so I you know hope to have stronger conclusions fairly soon um, but overall you know what is what is going on is this a case of the more you know the more what you don't know uh, so maybe that's part of what's going on. It, you know, confident, maybe students were, uh, maybe their confidence didn't so much decline, but they recognize, were better able to recognize their own limitations by the end of the semester. Um, maybe that's what's going on. And that's probably a good finding because then the, you know, we don't, we want people to be confident, but we don't want them to necessarily be overconfident and think they can do things they're not quite really able to do. So maybe that's what's going on. Um, you know, it's unknown what kind of research experiences students were participating in and how successful they were. Um, so I did ask students uh, um, demographic questions as well, including whether or not they had taken statistics and research methods, senior seminar, those kinds of questions. And I haven't been able to dive into that at all yet to see if, you know, students who were in those kinds of classes, um, if they had more confidence or less confidence compared to to others. Uh, but even if I know which classes they were in, it's only those core classes. I don't know what other elective courses they were in. I have no idea what other kinds of research experiences they may be having in those courses either, you know, without actually interviewing the teachers of those other courses the semester in which these students were enrolled. Um, you know, there's not a, a real way for me to um, gauge what kind of research experiences they may have been having outside of my specific courses and just an indication of if they were in or had taken other research classes. Uh, but overall, again, what is actually in the sociology curriculum and where could I locate this information? So that kind of led me to this last question on here, you know, thinking about, you know, how can I figure out what kind of research experiences they're having? You know, maybe I could study uh, syllabi from faculty. Uh, maybe I could interview them about their courses. Uh, but I, I wanted to kind of go a little bit broader and I and I wanted and I wasn't quite sure that was I wanted to really look at syllabi because there's limitations there too. You know, if I don't have the instructions for the assignments students are actually doing, um, just because something's listed on the syllabi doesn't mean it's really all that research intensive without me actually seeing the assignment itself or test itself or whatever it might be. Um, so I could see that there would have been some uh, limitations there. Um, so I thought I'm going to look at our textbooks and see what's in our textbooks um, as a way to start to examine what's going on throughout the curriculum on our side of things. So I have some data on what might be happening with our students, but what are we doing in the classroom? And so, you know, textbooks, uh, there is a lot of research using textbooks in sociology um, to the point where it's like, why even bother? People have examined textbooks um, in many different ways. Um, but textbooks disseminate knowledge of a discipline. Um, textbook knowledge is a cultural production. And even though um, this last point was uh, published in 1993, courses often reflect the textbooks. I would not be surprised if that is still true for, you know, the average course. Okay, so well, maybe many of you watching this are like, oh my, how I teach the class is so different from what my textbook is. 
maybe that's true for many of the people in this audience. It's probably not true for the average person teaching, say, intro to sociology, right? Especially when we consider that a lot of, uh, especially our intro level classes are taught by graduate students, are taught by adjuncts. Um, you know, these are not folks who have 20 years of, you know, sociological knowledge um, to be able to create a class completely from scratch without starting with, with a textbook. Um, so there's little reason to believe that courses are any more or less likely to reflect textbooks today. So they seem like a pretty good place to start to examine the curriculum overall. Um, so what do other scholars say about the many problems with our textbooks? Uh, they continue to include uh, no longer used ideas. They continue to include debunked concepts um, and promote myths. Um, so of course they don't say they're myths, uh, but they still promote many things that are simply untrue or that research has confirmed that, you know, this concept it's not quite what we what we think it is. Um, they tend to treat topics in isolation from one another, right? So like I uh, referring to uh, the courses and whether or not or the textbooks and whether they have a, a research methods chapter. Um, they might, but is it actually taught throughout the text or is it just that one chapter? Okay. Um, they fail to properly situate the topics in global context, um, provide misleading overviews of the state of the art in various subfields, neglect completely or largely fail to properly consider important topics altogether, um, they fail to include sociological research for new topics, fail to provide students with any means of adjudicating uh, between competing theories. In short, there's been lots of research on textbooks and sociology and it is overwhelmingly critical. Okay, and you know, to be fair, writing a textbook cannot be an easy process at all. There's a lot of competing interests, you know, the author's vision compared to what students want, what other faculty will use, you know, and what the publisher demands. So there are certainly a lot of um, com competing um, pressures on anyone who uh, undertakes something like uh, writing a textbook. Uh, so let me move on. Um, so uh, again, you can, um, you know, text this and it doesn't look like it's appearing on here, the actual texting information for you. Um, but I leave, believe it was Stephanie Med um, 208 and then went to, um, texted to 22333. Um, and then you can um, indicate which of these uh, would, you, know, you would agree with um, that most of the textbooks I assign provide excellent coverage of basic research methods. Um, so, you know, do you strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, or strongly disagree? So with this textbook study that I'm doing, um, my research questions include, you know, how does the text cover basic research methods, terms, and concepts? So things like sample, variable, very basic research terms. You know, are they defined? Are they used in any way? Are examples given? How is research methods addressed uh, throughout uh, the curriculum overall? So I'm doing this by looking at books that are for intro courses and also elective courses. Um, and then lastly, in, I argue most importantly, where are the missed opportunities to bring in research methods, instruction and content in these textbooks and by extension into the classroom. Uh, so my study, I limited uh, textbooks for inclusion if they were published between 2015 and uh, 2020. Um, and this, this way I could ideally get the most recent edition of whatever book it was. It would catch uh, a lot of books that way. Um, I excluded uh, readers, workbooks, compilations of case studies, annual editions, taking side style textbooks. So there were some types of books that we might use as text that I excluded altogether. So I'm thinking of a very conventional, um, traditional textbook. Um, if I had included those other types of books, it would have made comparison a lot more messy and difficult. 
Um, I found um, books um, from several sources. I searched publishers catalogs, going to the various publishers websites, Cengage, McGraw-Hill, Sage, Norton, you, you know the rest, right? Went to their websites to see what they had available. I contacted my book reps as well and I asked them, what's your top sellers? Um, and some of them were very forthcoming and some of them thought I was looking to adopt a book and were just confused by everything I was asking them. Um, so I also went to um, Amazon. So on Amazon, you can search um, books and you can specify um, books in sociology and also um, there's even some sub areas in sociology you can specify and it will give you the top selling books um, at um, at that particular moment. Um, so I could catch some books that way. Also not perfect because it's at that particular moment. Um, I was able to, once I identified all the books I could have for possible inclusion, I searched each of them on Amazon and I looked to see what their selling rank was overall. Um, so you see that when you go to Amazon that says like number 643 in sociology or whatever sub area it might be. So I also um, did that. Um, I also made sure to include um, some open um, access or open education books. So the open um, stacks book, um, sociology experiment is an online um, book overall. You still have to pay for it, but it's also something a little bit different. So I included that one too. Um, I chose the top two best-selling books from each publisher to include in the study. So that way I could kind of get a range of what's going on across publishers and not just what's going on um, necessarily in only the top selling books. Okay. Um, my sample size overall, I identified 64 introductory sociology books um, and 14 were selected for inclusion. Uh, I found 20 social problems books and six were included in the study. And then for the upper level um, textbooks, I focused on um, only books in the areas of marriage and family, race, class, and gender, because I thought that I would likely find the most books in these areas um, for sociology, that these are wildly popular courses across the country. So there's likely to be more books in these fields compared to others. The, my other rationale was that I was also likely going to be able to find a corresponding chapter on these topics in the intro in social problems books. Um, because I'm not closely analyzing the books in their entirety, I'm looking at the introductory chapter and um, if there's a family chapter, then I'm looking at that. And then I'm looking at one of these areas of inequality, either the, the race chapter, class chapter, or gender chapter. Um, and I plug them into like a random word selector so that, you know, e you know, I, so I'll have some books that, um, where I'm looking at the race chapter and some then looking at the gender chapter. Um, so ultimately I have a sample size of 29 um, textbooks. Um, the coding scheme, uh, so both me and my undergraduate research assistant are closely examining three chapters from each book. Um, we're coding key terms. Um, in any instances where doing research, doing science, doing sociology is discussed, uh, we're looking at the figures and tables in every uh, each of these books to see how the data is being presented. Is it being explained um, in a caption? Is it being referred to in the book in any way? Is there any instruction for the reader as far as how to read the table or the figure? Uh, is you know enough data presented? Is way too much data being presented? Um, so we're looking closely at those things. Anytime the author reports the results of the of a study, we're looking um, at that as well. Um, you know, preliminary, we see that more quantitative results tend to be presented. Um, you know, things like 68% of people in XYZ study agreed with whatever it is, uh, and qualitative data might. Qualitative studies are sometimes referred to, um, but it's very rare to actually find like snippets of qualitative data presented in the book itself, you know, some, a snippet from an interview or anything along those lines, um, which certainly is probably going to skew our students' perception perceptions of what quantitative and qualitative data is and what it looks like and how it's used. Um, so let's see, we are also recording anything else that seems noteworthy about how the textbook presents doing research. So anything else that kind of stands out as we're um, moving along. Uh, so overall, my ongoing research in this area seeks to understand how undergraduates gain 
knowledge, confidence, and experience doing research throughout the sociology curriculum and seeks to identify missed opportunities that exist in the sociology curriculum to help students develop their sociological research skills. Uh, so the overall question that ties together um, both projects is this, where are the missed opportunities uh, to bring in research methods instruction and content in not just those research methods courses, but throughout the curriculum, including intro to sociology, including those upper level electives. Uh, so can you identify any missed opportunities in your own uh, courses that you teach, you know, what might some of these missed opportunities be? So I'll um, pause for just a moment so you can uh, answer that. I see that there are missed opportunities that instructors, that individual instructors uh, could address, um, but this is also a question of things that overall departments can do. Um, and then of course, our textbooks and textbook creators. So for instructors, we can work to identify and provide students opportunities to do research and elective courses. Uh, so, and you know, to be honest, I didn't really take a hard look at what I was doing here until I taught that senior seminar class and was like, whoa, <laughs> what is going on? Um, and that, that's what, you know, where all this started to where I really started reflecting on this and thinking about, well, what can I do, right? Um, because I can control what I do for the most part. I, I can tell my colleagues like I am right now, but I can't make you do anything, but I can control what's happening in my class to, to some extent. Um, so in each of the classes that I'm teaching, I've tried to identify uh, you know, things that we can do that are also different from one class to another. So I don't want to just say, well, I'm going to start assigning literature reviews in every upper level class I teach. Well, that's only one skill. Or I'm going to have students start interviewing people in every single class. Again, that's one skill. Um, so in my juvenile delinquency course, I have begun having students work in groups to test theory by conducting surveys. So they look at the textbook, they identify a theory, they create each, each group creates five to six survey questions. We compile it all together into one survey instrument and they administer the survey. So they're able to uh, gain experience writing survey questions, which is probably the most uh, meaningful experience for them um, because they get the data and they're like, what is going on? I'm like, well, look at how you ask the question. Oh, yeah. So, you know, they start to understand the importance of writing good survey questions. Um, they get experience administering survey. So I say, you know, you can even come to my class because we're not presenting this re research anywhere else. You can come to one of my classes and, and do this. Um, so, you know, I have them volunteer who's going to come to one of my classes and actually administer the survey. Uh, that I have them uh, use Excel for this project um, just to kind of, you know, stretch them a little bit because they're using SPSS in the stats class. But um, you know, they're more likely to have access to Excel after they graduate. So just getting some experience and knowing they can manipulate data in there um, is worthwhile. Um, so they learn how to calculate frequencies. Uh, they really did though learn how challenging it is to create survey questions in a way where the respondent would respond in a way that was useful. Um, you know, there were cases where they gave open-ended questions and they thought it was straightforward. It was, um, there was a question about what is your parents' occupation? And when we got the results um, and the students were looking at it and they're like, we don't know how to make sense of this. And I looked at it um, and I'm like, I don't either. So you all just figure it out. And um, it, it is what it is, but now you know, like now you know that um, you need to give people either more specific instruction or convert this to a multiple choice question um, because it was, it was very interesting that some of the responses that we did get, um, you know, we, we would get people listing the place their parent worked, which is not an occupation. <laughs> um, and these were places where that could mean they were in a white collar position or a blue collar position. So that also, you know, we couldn't really do a whole lot with it, with the data. Um, but that wasn't really the point. It was getting that research experience. Um, in another class, I um, started a, a pro one of my own projects that we had IRB approval to begin with. And then they went and interviewed people. 
Um, and in another class, I really developed um, the literature review experience. I mean, taking a couple days of class to go over, here's how you uh, do a literature review, here's how you search for the literature, uh, really getting on them about identifying what key terms they use to search for things and keeping track of their results. Um, so really getting into it a whole lot more deeply than I ever um, did before. Um, so I wanted to try to create some sort of unique research component in each of my upper level courses. Um, making this a priority though requires me to let go of some of the substantive content from the course. Okay, so if you want students to do surveys um, and write survey questions, you're going to be given up at least a week of your class <laughs> so that they can compile the survey and we can go over the survey and why we might ask questions in a particular way. But I believe that this trade-off is worthwhile. Uh, you know, they can read more about the substantive topic on their own after they graduate. They're not going to get that hands-on experience doing research after they graduate for the most part like that if it doesn't happen in our classes when we have them in front of us it's probably not going to happen at all uh, so i think it's our responsibility to encourage the skill development um, missed opportunities for departments so if there's any way to make more efforts to bring undergraduates into the research process in a way that um, is encouraging for faculty it rewards them in some way and doesn't necessarily penalize them um, because for for many of us it might be well I have my own research to deal with I can't also mentor the student or I'm not going to get tenure I'm not going to get promoted uh, you know this that and the other so figuring out how to really encourage and create that culture of bringing undergraduates into the research process um, early on in a way that is rewarding for faculty not just rewarding in that gosh it makes me feel great as a teacher but actually um, meaningful um, in some way in terms of our careers um, departments could also sit down and identify what research research skills they want their graduates to have and make a much more concerted effort instead of just one individual at a time and saying here's where we're going to teach students about writing survey questions and we're going to do it in this elective and this elective and here's where we're going to have them practice doing interviews and we'll do it here and here and that can be very helpful too because then um, students are getting those skills again throughout the curriculum um, but those students who file, follow a particular professor are then also getting those skills and not just you know the um, you know if they're following me they're they're getting gaining some of this but if they're following someone else maybe less so um, so if there's a concerted effort in a department that could be helpful uh, for um, textbook creators um, I would argue that they that they need to describe how studies are done and not just present results. And if they're not going to do it in the textbook itself, um, make it real easy. This would be a lovely ancillary for the publishers to develop because they love their ancillaries. Um, but you know, providing here is the link to the article. Here's um, here are the you know five or six bullet points that someone who hasn't read the article could still you know communicate to a student um, to give them that information a little bit more context about how a study was actually done um, because otherwise they just think it's all opinion um, if they don't understand what the process actually looked like um, I would also argue that results need to be presented from qualitative studies as well so results and data um, not just percentages um, but actual you know words people say um, is also uh, really important uh, much of the um, scholarship on teaching research methods and sociology indicates success um, so maybe we need to publish more of those failures um, I agree with other scholars calls to develop a pedagogical culture for teaching research methods I extend their call and argue that if you are teaching sociology you are a research methods teacher don't leave it all up to the one person assigned to teach research methods at your institution um, it's everyone's job to help students develop these skills um, the responsibility to transmit methodological knowledge and develop research skills is the responsibility of all teachers of sociology um, we need to not only help students develop their sociological thinking skills but also their sociological research skills um, and infusing research methods instruction throughout the sociological curriculum should help uh, references as i said there's lots of literature in various areas um, here they're available upon request 
Um, again, I'm going to let you know how you can connect with me outside of this presentation. So I am on Twitter at Learn Sociology, um, or you can email me at smedleyr at iuk.edu. And lastly, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to share them via Poll Everywhere or contact me directly. Um, thank you for taking the time to watch all the way to the end. Thank you so very much, Dr. Medley Rapp. Um, this was such an amazing um, presentation and snob will address uh, those opportunities, those missed opportunities. I know I connected with those myself and started thinking right away and jotting down notes about how I, I am actually a culprit of teaching that one chapter and then that's it. But there are so many ways um, that I could infuse um, research methods in my elective courses and throughout my intro courses. So you have definitely got my wheels turning and I'm sure that others wheels are turning as well. So thank you so very much for this very enlightening um, snobble address for this year. And for those of you who are joining us, thank you so much for joining the 2020 North Central Sociological Association virtual conference.